All right, welcome everyone to today's seminar. Uh, today's seminar is going to be from Ying Zhao, Assistant Professor at the University of Alabama in Huntsville. Ying's research interests mainly focus on the Earth's magnetosphere, ionosphere, and upper atmosphere, and their dependence on the upstream solar wind. She has been actively studying magnetic reconnection, plasma convection, auroral dynamics, and thermospheric circulation using a combination of spacecraft and ground-based radars, imagers, magnetometers, and Fab Fabry Perot inferometers. She joined the Department of Space Science as an assistant professor in fall 2019, and before that was a Jack Eddy postdoc at Boston University. She received her PhD from UCLA in 2015, and we were happy to welcome Ying today. Ying, if you'd like to take it away. Thanks for the very nice introduction. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here. I still remember that um, one and a half year ago, Dave and Kyle initiated this seminar series with the hope that our community can stay united and strong during the pandemic, and one and a half year later, it is very grateful to see that we have weathered very well and continue to thrive. And this seminar series has also grown into a remarkably helpful resource. And today I would like to share um, a recent study my co-authors and I worked on this year, and that is unsteady main to pulse reconnection under quasi-steady solar wind conditions. Um, if you happen to have a background of solar physics or the Earth's main to tail physics, you might be surprised why we should even care about the steadiness or continuity of magnetic reconnection because reconnection typically occurs in a highly bursty manner. In this left animation, the sudden flash of light, this one is a solar flare and the brief duration of the solar flare is a clear signature that the reconnection occurs as a burst. The right figure shows uh, measurements of the nine side plasma sheet. And this velocity measurements um, show that embedded within the slow convection, there's an about 10 minute long sequence of bursty ball flow events. And the bursty ball flows are believed to be a product of main to tail reconnection and therefore their short duration um, imply that reconnection occur as bursts. So what makes things different at the day side main toe pause? Um, well, here the solar wind continuously compresses um, the day side main toe pause, forcing reconnection to happen. So maybe when the solar wind conditions are steady, reconnection would proceed steadily. Or maybe reconnection is inherently intermittent. And that's the question we are going to address in the rest of the talk. But before moving on, let's clarify the terminology. Intermittent reconnection means that reconnection turns on and off. And a continuous reconnection means that reconnection operates at a variable rate, but it never ceases. And a quasi steady reconnection or steady reconnection for short, reconnection rate fluctuates at a small fraction of the average. Numerous efforts have been made to understand um, the continuity or steadiness of day side main to pause reconnection based on observations at the main to pause in the cusp and in ionosphere. And in this the, and the next few slides, we will go through several representative observations. So at the main toe pause, intermittent reconnection manifests as flux transfer events or FTEs. And we already know that FTEs occur pretty commonly. So our emphasis is can reconnection ever be continuous or steady? So in order to capture continuous reconnection, the spacecraft orbit needs to parallel the main toe pause so that the spacecraft stays in proximity of the main toe pause current layer a current sheet for an extended amount of time. 
This type of geometry does not happen that often, but when it does happen, reconnection accelerated jets have been observed to persist continuously for one to 16 hours. And one example is shown at the bottom. Here, um, the orbit of the double star spacecraft, which is this magenta curve, is nearly tangential to the mantle pause. And for the one hour time, when a spacecraft is in the boundary layer, this light blue shaded region, um, the spacecraft observed reconnection jets, like here, you can see from the VL component, this green curve, every time it crossed the mantle pause current sheet. So that means reconnection was probably continuously active throughout this one hour long interval. Interestingly, continuous reconnection is often found to proceed unsteadily. And in this example presented here, coexisting with the continuous reconnection jets are flux transfer events as seen from these bipolar features in the BN component, this red curve. These flux transfer events are also marked by these short vertical lines. So this observation suggests that reconnection is only continuous rather than steady. So this slide is about observations made in the cusp. After reconnection, main to sheath ions on one hand would flow along magnetic field lines towards the ionosphere, and on the other hand would convect anti sunward with the magnetic field lines. And therefore, particles with large parallel velocity would precipitate close to the open closed field line boundary, whereas particles with smaller parallel velocity would precipitate at successively higher latitudes. And if you have a spacecraft traverse the cusp from low to high latitude, it would observe a distinctive, distinctive dispersion profile, um, like here with decreasing energy, like, yeah, with height and, uh, sorry, with time or with latitude. And the precipitation at a given latitude essentially depends on the time um, elapsed since the field line is reconnected. So if we have steady reconnection, we would expect to see a smooth and a continued dispersion like the bottom left figure. And if we have time dependent reconnection, we would expect to see discrete dispersion steps. And you can see both types of dispersion profiles have been observed, suggesting continuous and a steady reconnection are both possible. Um, discrete ion steps um, can also be caused by a spacecraft crossing reconnection of different spatial structures and separating this spatial and temporal effect is one of the main science goals of the upcoming tracer mission. Now, moving further down along the magnetic field lines, let's look at observations made in the ionosphere. So when reconnection happens at high latitude main to pause, it will create a proton aurora spot on the day side, polar of the general aurora oval, due to the precipitation of main to sheath ions that have traversed the main to pause boundary and accelerated by the magnetic kink. So therefore, this proton aurora spot can be used as a remote sensing tool of reconnection. One such proton spot um, is captured by the image spacecraft, and when plotting the peak or the mean brightness as a function of time, we can see that under this steady northward IMF, this black curve, um, the proton aurora spot occurred continuously for four hours. One caveat is that the brightness of aurora does not really relate to the reconnection rate, but the fact that the aurora spot never disappears, suggests that reconnection never completely ceases during this four hour, suggesting that reconnection is continuous or even quasi steady. Besides aurora, um, plasma convection in ionosphere can also serve as a remote sensing tool. So um, Reconnection at the main pause is associated with an electric field along the X line, which is a reconnection electric field. And because magnetic field lines are equipotential, the potential drop along the X line will be projected onto the ionosphere. In reality, this projection is achieved by the propagation of alpha wave originating from the reconnection site. 
um, and it takes about one to two minutes to reach equilibrium. So therefore, by tracking the flow moving across open closed field line boundary in the ionosphere, let's say, with the help of radars, we can essentially infer the time evolution of reconnection at the main tool pause. And interestingly, radar observations suggest that the reconnection electric field in ionosphere is almost always bursty. And one example is shown here. So this shows the reconnection electric potential as a function of universal time. And it's a, it is clear that the reconnection electric field changed drastically over time, even on short time scales, let's say 10 minutes or less. So in summary, Although some studies suggest that reconnection can be steady, other studies suggest that dayside mean to pause reconnection can at most be continuous rather than steady. So let's move on to numerical simulations and see what theorists and modelers say about the causes of the unsteady reconnection, you know, if solar wind driving is steady. In MHD simulations, bursty reconnection or FTEs are found to occur due to various reasons. For example, large dipole tilt, current driven instability, and flow vortices. And here I'm just showing the large dipole tilt mechanism um, as an example. So these four panels are for noon midnight meridional cuts of the regions close to the main tool pause. Um, noon is to the, oh, sorry, sun is to the right. The color represent the north-south velocity, um, north-south component of plasma velocity. The red curves are flow lines and the black um, contours are magnetic field lines. The large dipole tube is a key here because it displaces the flow stagnation point. You can see from the transition from the northward flow to the southward flow from the magnetic separator, which is at the bottom left corner of each panel. So this forms two reconnection X line, one along the stagnation point, the, the other along the stagnation, uh, along the separator. At first, one FTE forms between these two reconnection X lines. And because this FTE is embedded in this bluish color, which means southward magnetic sheath flow, the, main, the FTE was drifted downward. And as FTE drifts away, the main tool pause current sheet thins. It thins until the main tool pause flow, a main tool sheet flow pinches the current sheet at a stagnation point, and then a new FTE forms. And this sequence just can, uh, repeats. So this theory predicts that FTEs are a seasonal dependent phenomenon and it would predominantly occur during the winter hemisphere. And it also predicts that the periodicity of FTE essentially determine, uh, is determined by the time it takes for FTE to propagate away from its source location. Um, of course, one limitation of FTE is that it does not include ion scale physics and therefore it does not really capture the real physics of reconnection, nor does it include foreshock and the main to sheath waves. And when these processes are considered, global hybrid simulations have found that main to sheath play a vital role in regulating the dayside reconnection. Specifically, the local reconnection rate has been found to vary due to main to sheath fluctuations, the effects of neighboring X lines, and the motion of passing magnetic islands. And here shows one global hybrid simulation that is driven on a steady and a purely southward IMF. And the left panel shows a noon midnight meridional cut. The color represent plasma beta. Despite um, the steady and a purely southward IMF, the main to sheath is filled with um, dynamic and kinetic structures, which are likely to be magnetic neuronal waves. The figure on the right shows the reconnection electric field, um, like the distribution of reconnection electric field over different Z, and also how this distribution changes with time. So two features to note. First, the location of X line changes drastically with time. And this motion is either due to Meinoshi's background flow or due to the effects of neighboring X lines. 
because at times the X line can even move against the main Lucy's background flow. The second feature is that the strength of the reconnection electric field changes substantially over time. And the authors find, um, find that the changes are predominantly due to the changes of metal sheath parameters. And the changes in the metal sheath parameters are further due to waves, like here in the metal sheath, as well as passing magnetic islands. One special feature that has been shown um, to affect reconnection inside the magnetic sheets is the high-speed jets. So because high-speed jets have um, higher dynamic pressure than their surrounding, when they arrive at the magnetic pause, they may locally compress the magnetic pause current sheet and trigger reconnection to happen. And the observational evidence is shown on the left. Um, the first three panels are the ion energy spectrum, magnetic field, and the plasma velocity. So as magnetic pause moves inward, um, passing by this um, Themis spacecraft, no reconnection occurred, even though um, the magnetic shear is pretty high. Then high-speed jet activity starts, and one high-speed jet is captured by the spacecraft as highlighted by the magenta curves. Immediately following the high-speed jets, um, magnetic pause moves outward, and here reconnection signature is observed. So that means reconnection has activated, possibly due to the compression effect of high-speed jets. And this observational sequence is supported by the global hybrid simulation. The top row show the Nguyen Minlai original cut of dynamic pressure. Um, the bottom row shows, again, Nguyen Minlai original cut with the resistive, resistive term in Ohm's law, and the sun is to the left. So the structures with high dynamic pressure are high-speed jets. And as they arrive at the main to pause, the main to pause is perturbed inward, current is intensified, and reconnection is triggered. So here's our motivation. So after decades of observational studies, whether dayside reconnection can be continuous or steady remains controversial. But many studies, particularly those based on in situ and radar observations, suggest that reconnection is at most continuous <laughs> rather than steady. And with the advancement of global hybrid simulation, a potentially important role of mental sheath dynamics has been proposed. The concise question we have in mind is that is reconnection steady, continuous, or intermittent when a solar wind driving is quasi steady? And if it is unsteady, what is the driver of the variations? To answer these questions, uh, we employ spacecraft constellations and space ground conjunctions. Specifically, we use Omini and a GeoTail to obtain the solar wind and IMF conditions. We use Themis for, to identify occurrence of mental pause reconnection and to determine mental sheath conditions. We use Superdarm to track the time evolution of mental uh, pause reconnection. And as will be seen later, we specifically were intentionally select Superdarm data during the special operation mode where the data have high cadence so that we won't miss any rapid variation in the reconnection electric field that may otherwise be smoothed out in the nominal cadence data. So overall, this forms a relatively extensive observatory network that allow us to study the behavior of reconnection and its drivers. So let's start with the solar wind conditions. The left column shows the Omini measurements um, and the pink shaded region shows the interval that will be analyzed in detail in the following slides. But looking at this three and a half hour, IMF BZ was initially about zero and then turned steadily southward since maybe 1550 UT. BY was steadily negative throughout. BX has a pretty large component and statistically large BX would favor turbulence to form in the main two sheets. In Omini, the proton density gradually decreased. 
The right column show the geotail measurement, and the geotail is located 21 Earth radius upstream of the Earth, 21 Earth radius to the dusk, and four Earth radius to the north. The measurements are similar to Omini, but the IMF BZ is less southward, and also the solar wind density was lower and much more, uh, much steadier than the Omini. But overall, the two data sets suggest that solar wind drivings are, were quasi-steady. Here, let's look at the geometry of the spacecraft constellation and the space ground conjunction. The left panel showed the locations of the three Themis, uh, Themis spacecraft in equatorial plane. Um, the three spacecraft have pretty close inter-spacecraft separation that's less than one Earth radius. And as will be seen later, Themis A crossed the mantle pause several times, detecting re uh, reconnection signature. And Themis D and Themis E stayed inside the mantle sheets, providing measurements of the upstream mantle sheets conditions. The figure on the right shows the footprints of the Themis spacecraft um, in the northern hemisphere. Noon is to the left. Um, these color tiles represent radar line of sight velocity. And here I only show the line of sight velocity moving away from the radar, which is here, um, because this away motion correspond to anti-sunward motion, and that's what expected for um, low latitude reconnection. And you can see Themis A footprint was very close to um, the radar field of view, suggesting that the spacecraft and the radar measure the same physical process at a different altitude threaded by the magnetic field lines. Um, one thing you may notice is that here the radar line of sight measurements are only available from three beams rather than the nominal 16 beam pattern. And that's because we only select special operation mode um, data. Okay, so since Themis A is located at such a favorable location to identify reconnection, let's look at their observation. From top to bottom, we have magnetic field, ion energy spectrum, ion density, ion velocity, and the comparison of ion velocity, the measured ion velocity versus the Wallen prediction for reconnection outflow. Themis A crossed the main to pause five times, as seen from the red arrows, which highlight the rotations in the magnetic field. For the first crossing, plasma, although plasma was accelerated, the main acceleration direction was in the M direction, and that's inconsistent with acceleration due to reconnection. For the second crossing and third and the last crossing, the plasma was accelerated northward, then southward, and then southward. So compared with the background mate or sheets, these accelerated flow speed are alphanic, suggesting that they are probably accelerated due to reconnection. And in fact, if we compare these accelerated speed with the prediction of Wallen relation for reconnection, a good agreement can be found. So these suggest that reconnection were, was active during those times. So we are left with the fourth crossing. During this crossing, plasma was only weakly accelerated. But as seen from the next slide, from the ion distribution function, the distribution function still shows a D-shaped pattern, implying that reconnection was still active around that time. So here shows the four distribution functions of these four main to pause crossings. In all snapshots, we can see the main to sheets population as this relatively hot and a dense population. And um, they all have a D shape because of the transmission and the reflection of mantle sheets particles at current sheet. And the bulk velocity of these mantle sheets populations are consistent with a Wallen prediction. So all these observations suggest that reconnection was first inactive among during the first crossing and then activated. But it is unclear whether reconnection stays continuously activated or turn on and off between the crossings. And if it is a former, that would imply reconnection could be continuous or even steady. 
But at least in terms of the location of the X line, the X line drifted from being southward of the spacecraft to northward, uh, northward of the spacecraft, just because um, the direction of the reconnection accelerated jets reversed. Fortunately, we can infer the continuity or steadiness of reconnection um, through the measurements made in the conjunct uh, in by the radars in a conjugate ionosphere. So this is a relatively busy plot, and I will walk you through panel by panel. The first panel shows the radar spectral width, and this is um, this essentially reflects how stable the soft target of the radar, which are um, plasma density structures in ionosphere are over time. The cosmic ionosphere is often associated with turbulence due to enhanced wave activity and a soft particle precipitation. So cusp is associated with high spectral width. And this sharp gradient from low spectral width to high spectral width um, can serve as a good proxy of the open closed field line boundary. And this open closed field line boundary is marked by these black plus signs. You can see it is more or less stagnant, and that's expected because the solar wind conditions were so steady. This stagnant um, open closed field line boundary also suggests that the reconnection electric field is primarily contributed by plasma motion moving across the um, open closed field line boundary in the rest frame. So let's look at the velocity measurements. The panel B shows the plasma velocity average to the nominal cadence, which is one to two minutes. If you think about it, given a one to two minute cadence, radar can only resolve um, variations of reconnection on time scales of two to four minutes. And if radar needs data needs further smoothed due to random noise or fluctuations, then the resolvable time scale would be even longer. So in this low cadence velocity data, we can see that there are two enhanced flows with velocities around 600 meter per second and above. And these two flows originate from open closed field line boundary and a direct polarward. So that's a clear signature that they are ionosphere counterpart of main to pulse reconnection. Um, these two flow structures are separated by a weak convection in between and interestingly, this weak convection occurred around the same time when in situ reconnection signature was absent at the main two pods. And this enhanced flow following the weak convection occurs around a time when Themis observed in situ signature. So this corroborates the close connection and agreement between the spacecraft and the radar observations and confirm that we are measuring the same process at different altitudes. So as mentioned before, the limitation of low cadence data is that we cannot really say and ambiguously that whether reconnection proceeds continuously or steadily after activation. This because although we see some velocity fluctuations, they appear somewhat sporadic and we are not clear whether they are they truly reflect variations of reconnection or due to noise or random arrows. The third panel is a high cadence data at nine seconds. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention, um, the special operation mode we use in this event is ULF wave mode. So this mode was initially invented to study ULF wave and the temporal resolution of this mode is nine seconds as compared to one to two minutes. So through this nine second data, we can clearly see the fluctuations seen in panel B are real. And they, are, they occur because each flow enhancement consists of series of flow bursts that drift polarward with time. And these, um, so yeah, if the Superdome team is listening, please schedule the operation mode more often because such kind of high cadence data are, are very helpful to study the fast variation of reconnection electric field. But the devil S, the fluctuating velocity plus the stagnant open closed field line boundary suggesting that the reconnection electric field is fluctuating. Now, to obtain a quantitative measure of um, these fluctuations, we plot the velocity 
right above the open closed view line boundary in panel D. So here, a sequence of flowbers is evident. And to count how many flowbers have occurred, we, we require the flow peak to be above 600 meter per second, this dotted line, and then a increase from previous valley, this delta V, by 200 meter per second. And then 10 such flowbers are identified, and the initiation of this flow is marked by these dashed black lines. The bottom panel F um, shows the wavelet analysis of the velocity in panel D. And we can see the flow burst occurrence is not really periodic, but has somewhat broad, uh, not really broad, but have a distribution that limited below 10 millihertz. There's one peak around three millihertz that's correspond to 5.5 minute, a second peak about five millihertz, which correspond to 3.3 mil mi minutes. And if you look carefully, there might be a third peak around 10 millihertz. Okay, so we know the magnetic, uh, we know reconnection um, driven ionospheric flows or the reconnection electric field fluctuates. But how significant is this fluctuation? So here we show the amplitude of delta V, which is the delta V here in histogram. Um, our primary focus is a case study presented in previous figures, but just to corroborate the distribution trend, we also surveyed events with similarly high cadence data and also occur under steady solar wind conditions. And the red indicates the case study, the black represent those multi-case study. And overall, the, trend, uh, the red and the black show very similar pattern. So we find that the velocity delta V is often two to 600 meter per second, but can reach above six meter per second, 23% of time. And if we translate this to reconnection electric field by using the IGRF model at, uh, for the ionosphere, then we find a reconnection electric field about 10 to 30 milliwatts in the ionosphere. And if we trace this electric field to the main topos, that would correspond to 0 0.3 to 0.8 milliwatts per meter. If you have ever looked at the reconnection electric field measured by MMS, the reconnection electric field typically is one to two milliwatts per meter. So 0 0.3 to 0.8 meter uh, milliwatts per meter change actually is quite significant. The figure on the right shows the fraction of delta V over the peak of each flow burst. Um, and we can see that um, most of the flow bursts fall into 0.3 to 0.6. And if you recall that steady reconnection means that the reconnection rate fluctuates at a small fraction and the intermittent reconnection means reconnection turns on and off. Then we select 0.3 as a threshold for steady reconnection, 0.7 for um, reconnection uh, for intermittent reconnection. Then the majority of our flow burst imply reconnection is continuous, but unsteady. Okay, so with the spacecraft at the main pause and with radar measurements, we find that under quasi-steady solar wind driving, main pause reconnection is only continuous, not steady. So let's investigate what is the driver of the unsteady reconnection. And the first feature we look at is high-speed jets, because as mentioned in the introduction, high-speed jets can compress the main pause locally and trigger reconnection to happen. Um, located in the main sheath, Themis D and Themis E provide an excellent opportunity to study um, the upstream main sheath conditions of reconnection. From top to bottom, we have magnetic field, ion energy spectrum, ion density, ion velocity, and dynamic pressure. And high speed jets are often identified as regions of dynamic pressure that exceeds half of the pressure of the solar wind. And therefore the black line is the pressure of the main sheets and the blue is the half of the dynamic pressure of the solar wind, according to Omini. So Themis-E captured high-speed jets here 
and SMSD capture one just fell short of that definition. But all of these high-speed jets occur around 1610. If we go back to look at the flow bursts in ionosphere, most of them occur around 1630 and afterwards. So during that time, no high-speed jets were observed. So this mismatch in occurrence time implies that high-speed jets may not be the main driver of the unsteady reconnection, um, at least for the current event. The second candidate we look for is mantle sheath fluctuations. Um, because as the mantle sheath fluctuations arrive at the mantle pause, it may change the geometry of magnetic reconnection and affects the rate. And we indeed see rapid fluctuations in the mantle sheath magnetic field, particularly the BZ component. So we therefore replace the bottom figure of the, uh, the bottom panel of the previous figure with a wavelet analysis of these main two sheets, uh, the BZ. And we can see that these fluctuations are limited to frequency range below 10 millihertz. Um, for SMSD, it first observed a relatively broad band um, fluctuations and then a peak at a three millihertz. For SMSE, one peak at, SM, uh, at three millihertz, another peak at five millihertz, and maybe some higher order peaks. And this distribution of frequency actually is very similar to the ionospheric flow, which is shown on the right. In the ionosphere, the flow burst also fluctuates um, at a frequency mostly below 10 millihertz with peaks at three millihertz or five millihertz. So this great similarity in the frequency suggests that the magnet mantle sheet fluctuations can be a plausible driver of the unsteady reconnection. If we look carefully, there could be small discrepancies though. For example, in ionosphere measurements, like the figure on the right, the three millihertz fluctuation starts from the onset, like the start of this time interval lasting all the way to 1655. But when we look at the Themis main Toshi's measurements, the three millihertz last a much shorter time than the ionosphere flow. And the same thing for the five millihertz. However, this discrepancy can potentially be reconciled if we concatenate the occurrence at themis D and themis E, assuming that fluctuations from either source would reach the main pause and affect reconnection. So still, we think that mantle sheath fluctuations are a possible driver of the unsteady reconnection. Last but not least, let's discuss what could be the source of the mantle sheath fluctuations. Generally speaking, mantle sheath fluctuations can occur due to fluctuations in a solar wind, which really doesn't apply to our event, um, waves, from the, uh, from the foreshock, waves formed at the bow shock and the main toe sheets, or waves created within the main toe sheets. Unfortunately, we don't have a spacecraft located at the foreshock or the bow shock to tell us the source of the waves. But fortunately, we can compare with previous global simulation to infer the source of the fluctuations. And this is um, the same simulation I show in the introduction made by Jonathan. And I compare to his um, simulation because his simulation was driven by a Thalsworth IMF with a large radio component, which is similar to the observed IMF. And also his main to she's show fluctuations, um, just like observations. These different uh, colored lines of different colors just represent lines taken from different times. So in his simulation, he finds that these waves result from the transmission and amplification of foreshock UF wave, which can be identified from these density perturbation upstream of the quasi-parallel bow shock. So to see whether our observed main to sheath fluctuations are the same type of fluctuations as the simulation, we again compare the wavelet analysis. The left shows observation, the right shows um, the simulation. Here, the simulation frequency is normalized to the ion cyclotron frequency, which in our case would correspond to 0.3 hertz. Um, the simulated frequent, uh, fluctuations are mostly limited to 
0.03 or 0.04 um, ion cyclotron frequency with peaks around maybe like just below 0.01, something like that. So when we um, plug in this um, 0.3 hertz into this ion cyclotron frequency, we find that um, the fluctuations have, would peak around 2.4 to 9.0 millihertz. And that's, again, very consistent with observation because our observations suggest that the frequency are mostly limited below 10 millihertz with peaks at a three and a five millihertz. So this would be the summary. Um, continuity and steadiness of daylight need to pause reconnection under quasi-steady solar wind driving is examined using space ground conjunctions. Reconnection proceeds continuously, but unsteadily. Reconnection electric field varies at frequencies below 10 millihertz with peaks at three and five millihertz. And the variation amplitudes are 10 to 30 millihertz, uh, sorry, <laughs> millivolts per meter in ionosphere and 0 0.3 to 0.8 millivolts per meter at equatorial mantle pause. And this is a substantial variation of the reconnection electric field because it represents 30 to 60 of the peak reconnection electric field. The unsteadiness of reconnection can be plausibly explained by the fluctuating magnetic field in the turbulent window sheets. And a comparison with previous global hybrid simulation suggests that it is the four shock waves that drive the mantle sheets fluctuations and hence modulate the reconnection. Before concluding, several extra notes. Although we identified mantle sheets fluctuations um, to be the main driver of unsteady reconnection, um, it may not be always the case. Generally speaking, the temporal variations of daylight mantle pause reconnection could be, to, could be due to a multitude of reasons. For example, dipole tilt. Um, although not a lot, as far as I know, there are at least two studies supporting that FTEs do occur preferentially during the winter season. Um, also current driven instabilities, flow vortices, mantle sheets fluctuations, including high-speed jets, passing magnetic islands. Um, and the relative importance of these roles may vary from case to case. So probably the question really is what process dominates the unsteady reconnection for a given condition? Another thing is that although mantle sheets fluctuations affect local reconnection rate, it is unclear whether they affect, also affect the global reconnection rate. And um, we don't really know now, but probably no because maybe the global reconnection rate is controlled by the upstream solar wind conditions. Last but not least, after considering all these drivers that can make reconnection unsteady, I'm actually curious whether dayside reconnection can ever manage to be steady. Um, in my data survey, I have never found a good event where dayside reconnection is steady, but I would stay tuned for the upcoming tracer mission to tell me that maybe reconnection can be steady. And that's all what I want to cover. And um, I would be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you, Ying, for a wonderful talk. Um, we do have a few questions uh, from a couple of the attendees. Um, our first question is from Eric Lund, and it's regarding the cusp aurora and its relation to dayside reconnection. If the brightness of the cusp aurora is not correlated with the reconnection rate, then what causes variations in the brightness? That's a good point. Um, I think the IMF, is that clock angle or dynamic pressure may have a more direct um, effect on the cusp aurora intensity. I think that's what we know at this point. So therefore, um, this would I would say that that would be the cause of the variation in the brightness is, you know, there are still small variations in the dynamic pressure and then changes in the IMF. All right, thank you. Um, we next have a couple of questions from Hugh Hudson. Um, in solar flares, it's pretty clear that there is evidence of a buildup and a release with long periods of no reconnection. Uh, so defined as uh, release of energy. 
Are there clear examples in the magnetopause or in magnetopause re reconnection of this type of behavior, um, kind of a buildup? Um, I'm not really sure about the buildup. I think one thing that has been observed is the current sheet thinning. And typically, um, yeah, if we go back to the simulation result, you can kind of like see that between FTE, um, there is a thinning of plasma sheet process, um, a thinning process of the plasma of the current sheet. And typically, FTE, I guess statistically, the periodicity of FTE can change from three minutes to eight minutes to seven minutes, depending on what data set you are looking at. So maybe this thinning can happen on like a few minutes time scale. Okay. Um, so as a follow-up, um, do we understand why there's the three to five millihertz uh, fluctuations which dominate? Um, I think that's kind of like a common frequency we would observe for four shock waves. So I would attribute those to the instabilities in the four shock, kind of like the reflection of ion beams and its interaction with the instant solar beams. Okay, thank you. Um, so our final question comes from Jason Schuster. Um, he's curious about the, about the recently observed re electron only reconnection uh, by MMS in the turbulent magneto sheath. Do you think it might be possible to see ground-based evidence of electron only reconnection and determine steady versus bursty nature of this new process or whether the topological change associated with electron only reconnection might not be significant enough to see on the ground? That's an interesting question. So for ionosphere to see, I guess first it needs to have a field line connected to the Earth's magnetic field. So probably not complete, not complete in the main two sheets or let's say at the bow shock. A second thing that um, I actually don't know what's the topology change involved in the magnetic field for electron only reconnection. Um, but in order for ionosphere to resolve that, I would say something has to be larger than like 0 0.3, 0 0.5 Earth radius in asymptotal direction. Um, is that a size for reconnection only? Um, I, I mean, electron only reconnection. But yeah, so at least based on the current um, radar resolution and or probably even the imager resolution, we need something a few tenths of, at least a few tenths of Earth's radius, large. As we have another question from Elizaveta Antonova. Um, can you show the validity of the frozen in relation before the observed reconnection events? Is it possible to determine, to determine if you do have a frozen in plasma? Oh yeah, I can definitely take a look at that. We didn't do that, um, but yeah, that's a good suggestion. Um, so that's all the questions we have today. Uh, thank you very much, Ying, uh, and thank you for the kind comments at the beginning of your talk. Uh, next week, uh, we will continue with uh, some talks uh, with Frederick Wilder, who will continue to talk about dayside reconnection, um, but this time looking at the Kelman-Helmholtz instability at Earth and examining reconnection, turbulence, and ion acoustic waves. So thank you again, Ying. We really appreciate your time and we look forward to seeing everyone next week. Thank you.